This podcast is sponsored by nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today I will be talking to a horror legend, a legend whose name should come up a, more, a lot more often than it, than it does, and I'm talking about Ted Bohus. Ted, of course, wrote the original story for The Deadly Spawn, the classic homage to cheesy 50s sci-fi horror movies. He's also worked on such movies as Night Beast, Fiend. Um, he was special effects supervisor on Mind Killer. He did special makeup effects on Lone Wolf. Um, he directed uh, Vampire Vixens from Venus, starring my good friend Michelle Bauer. And of course, Regenerated Man. And um, October 29th through the 31st, he'll be at ChillerCon in Persephone, New Jersey. And it's going to be a great conversation today. Like I said, he's a legend in the world of horror, and it's going to be a great conversation. And wait till you see the toe curlers I have next week on Splat from the Past. Also tomorrow, too, I'm going to have some great guests coming up. I'm not going to say who in particular, because I don't want to spoil everything. But I've got a great guest as I celebrate 1981, 1986, and all the other milestone years. But those were the best years of this year's milestone anniversaries of horror. So yeah, here is my interview with Ted Bohus. Going back in time, did you gravitate toward uh, horror and sci-fi movies early on in your childhood? Uh, yeah, uh, probably back, you know, way back, probably in the 60s, 70s, uh, I had a friend of mine, Charlie Chubak, uh, uh, that I met that was also interested in films, and uh, we got together and started, you know, like a lot of kids, making our own Super 8 movies uh, with friends, you know, we made little horror films, little uh, comedy films, and um, eventually we put sound on them because we bought, uh, you know, Super 8 sound projectors, so we'd actually sit there with a microphone and put sound on them and started recording movies off the television because, you know, back then, you didn't have anything. There was no, there was no internet. There was no VHS. There was no DVD. There was nothing. You, to watch a movie, you had to literally wait until it came on TV again to see it all cut up. So right. we would actually take a camera, put it on the TV, record that, and then put a soundtrack on it, recording the soundtrack, and then add that to the to the film and make our own, you know, little Super 8 movies. And eventually, uh, we graduated into, you know, doing 16 millimeter, and eventually then 35, and then and then features. So. But yes, as, as a kid, um, always liked that kind of stuff. As long as it had a monster in it or something like that with makeup, uh, that's what we enjoyed. Wow, sounds like you were pretty advanced because most people who made Super 8 films in those days had no sound to it, but you got to have a sound to it. Yeah, well, we were lucky because uh, one of our friends' um, uh, father worked at uh, Umic, was the name of the company, uh, in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in New York. And he introduced us to this, this sound camera. We found out about it, and then we went over there and got them. And yeah, it was a real interesting thing to be able to take, you shoot your own movies, you, you have to send them to a service. And then they would sound stripe them. They would put a sound, a, a, stri a strip of the magnetic recording um, element on the film. So when you threaded that up into your projector, into the Humic, then you could actually record as you're watching it, record right on it. So a lot of times hmm. what we would do is we would take uh, movies like Laurel and Hardy films uh, <laughs> that were their silent movies, and we would sit there surrounded with pots and pans and, and all kinds of horns and stuff, and we would do, try to do the dialogue and do all the sound effects to these films uh, ourselves. So that's uh, the kind of stuff we thought was fun in those days. <laughs> that's awesome. Do you remember the first um, one that you saw that, like, sparked your interest? Well, I mean, there's nothing new here. It's like everybody, you know, watching King Kong, you know, watching you know, Ray Harryhausen films, the mm -hmm. Sinbad and that type of thing. You know, when you see those kind of movies, that's, you know, immediately you say, wow, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to do that. And, and the same thing with publishing. Uh, you know, as soon as I would see, you know, these, uh, you know, magazines come out, you know, fanzines at the time, like, you know, FXRH and uh, Photon, you know, you immediately you wanted to, to do that because these were magazines that were about all the stuff that you really liked. So eventually then I got into that as well. I see. 
And the, the, did you were you into like uh, Roger Corman, William Castle, and Herschel Gordon Lewis? Um, oddly enough, those type of films were, were not my favorites. My my favorite type of films were, uh, you know, The War of the Worlds, Forbidden Planet, The Year Stood Still, The Thing from Another World. Those are the kind of films uh, that I really liked. Mostly the science fiction stuff. I wasn't. I was never a big fan of like the real cheapy stuff. Even though that's what I had to make myself, only because of the money. But you know, for me to watch, those were never you know my favorite films. Even though there were a few of them that I thought were you know really good and fun. But you know, who would rather watch uh, Invasion of the Eye Monsters when you could watch Forbidden Planet? The the day the Earth stood still. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, um, it, it was funny d- during a uh, convention I was a guest at with, with um, Robert Weiss. Yeah. Uh, I told him I said I had an idea for uh, Davy Stood Still because you know the movie was so good, and I said how about releasing it, uh, re-releasing it because I know they would talk at that time. This was many many years ago before the remake was made, and I said uh, instead of doing a remake on the film how about taking the original film colorizing it and adding special effects because now we can you can do anything with you know with cgi so i said you know all the different scenes replace the ship replace the robot with some cool transforming thing mm-hmm. and now you'd show how he got from the saucer to the jail cell you know i mean how, how did this thing just lumber through the city no of course not. I mean, you'd see him convert into something else and shoot up into the clouds and then come down in the alley and it just add all these different scenes and explain stuff and, and replace the special effects and he thought it was a great idea and of course but nothing ever came of it i still think it's a good idea yeah. <laughs> it would still be better than that new one that came out with keanu reeves yeah, well, maybe that can be a post-COVID project for you, you know? <laughs> well, I'm retired now, so I think I'll put the idea out there, but I'll let somebody else actually do the work. Yeah. <laughs> so you're born and raised in New Jersey? Uh, pretty much. Uh, you know, I was born here, and with the family, we moved to um, Columbia, South America for about four years. Uh, then we came hmm. back and lived in Florida for a couple months. Then we moved to Virginia and stayed there for a few years, and then eventually moved back here to... Uh, Good old New Jersey, well, well, where I am now. What was Columbia like? Uh, well, you talk about the 60s, so it was a, a very strange time. You, you know, I mean, as Americans there, I mean, it was great. I mean, there, there was the class system, so you were either rich or poor. And being Americans there and having money, it was incredible. But there were crazy things going on there, revolutions and, you know, all kinds of stuff. I mean, it would be unusual to be walking downtown and seeing people hanging by their necks with their tongues hanging down to their stomachs, you know, up on lampposts. And so they'd have to rush us all to the American embassy and, you know, stuff like that would happen. But, you know, which is pretty shocking when you're, you know, a 10 year old kid. Yeah. (laughs) Was a drug culture just happening at the time? Yeah. I mean, you didn't know much about that because you were so young, but yeah, I'm I'm sure that, you know, at that time in the sixties that was going on. Yeah. So after high school, did you attend college? Just briefly, uh, I went to um, uh, a couple of colleges, and you know what ended up that you know I did because I knew more about movies than the teachers. I would end up actually <laughs> teaching the classes myself, and because I would bring in, I had sixteen millimeter copies of a lot of the films, and we'd bring them in, discuss them, and um, so yeah, I went for a while because I thought crazily I, I might get into psychology for a while, and uh, but I wasn't really impressed with how that was going with child psychology it just I, it just didn't seem right so uh, the next thing is I just you know got into you know doing films and that was it yeah I can relate you know I took a film class um, right after high school and the, the the last day of the last day of class teacher told me not to come back next semester because I kept correcting him in front of students <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I mean, you know, because at that time I was actively, you know, working on films, and these are teachers that have never done a thing except, you know, they taught film, but they never really made movies, you know. So, you know, I had the actual experience. Yeah. So did the the did the magazine come first before you started making films? Uh, yeah, the magazine started. The first one was in nineteen seventy six, I believe. Um, there was a magazine called Special Effects Magazine, uh, SPFX, Special right. Effects Magazine. And, um, you know, I, I did that because my friend, Ernie Farino, 
at the time was doing FXRH, you know, special effects created by Ray Harryhausen. Right. And so I thought as sort of a nod to that, I would do, you know, I, I mean, because the, the real abbreviation at the time for special effects was SFX. So I right. just thought it was a little clearer to make SPFX, like special effects, and it was also a little nod to FXRH. So, um, you know, I did that because, I'm, you know, stupidly, I thought, well, how could you keep making a magazine about the same guy? You know, how, you know you're going to run out of material eventually. Uh, so I just wanted to do something that was about special effects in general, you know, special effects movies, mostly from the, you know, the early movies. And so, you know, I did that, you know, for a while. And uh, I only stopped doing that uh, maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, because now I'm doing the books, the, you know, the Candid Monsters books. Um, yeah. Now I could do it in a bigger format, you know, instead of having, you know, 36 pages, I can have 150 pages and, uh, you know, really do some in-depth um, you know, articles and stuff. And I have a lot of friends that have this stuff. So besides me doing, you know, material I have from my own magazine, I have friends that like Tom Weaver that, that interviewed just about everybody and, uh, you know, friends that have articles and interviews I could use. So I'm you know, incorporating that all into this, you know, the Candid Monsters series of books. And now I'm, uh, I'm working on the 13th book. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Oh, that's awesome. Congrats. When um, you start, first started the magazine, were you able to get interviews with, uh, you know, special effects guys in the in, in the industry? Yeah, well, don't forget, I mean, <laughs> you know, more people were alive back then in the 70s. Yeah. So, um, like now, you know, trying to get to talk to, you know, people that worked on the films in the 40s, 50s, even 60s, I mean, is, is, is tough, um, because most of them are, most of them are gone, but, but yeah, I, I mean, uh, Luckily, a lot of the studios like ILM and stuff like that, I had friends that worked at ILM, um, they really enjoyed the magazine. So I really had some nice access. So some of the magazines actually covered, you know, interviews with Phil Tippett. And, you know, I mean, it was, you know, I had a lot of uh, good material that I could use from uh, Industrial Light and Magic, which was, you know, very handy at the time. But yeah, a lot, a lot of the uh, people from the 50s were, you know, still around. So I was able to, uh, to get a pretty good amount of interviews and even stuff for the Hitchcock films Wow, nice. Yeah, the, there were guys like Dick Smith and uh, the Westmores and the Bermans. They were all uh, doing the special effects makeup. And, of course, Rick Baker was, you know, up and coming at the time. Okay. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. and so this was like, you know, this was like pre-Fangoria. So, like, the only other horror magazine at the time was probably Famous Monsters, right? Yeah, the, 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 yeah, back then in the you know sixties and seventies, the only thing you really had was you know famous monsters and and the people that started doing you know the fanzines um, uh, like Mark Frank with Photon and you had Castle of Frankenstein and you had uh, Cine Fantastique you, you know came around. So I mean, you had a number of these you know fan magazines that were out there and and yeah, but that's all you know that's all we had. Yeah, how did you meet um, Don Doler and get to associate produced Fiend? I think we just probably started corresponding because of the, the magazines. Uh, and then uh, we, we got together and we said, you know, why don't we, uh, you know, get together and, and make some movies, start our own little production company and make some movies. And and we did for a while. I mean, we worked on, you know, I worked with him on uh, Night Beast and, and Fiend. And, but, you know, Don liked to do things, you know, his own way up there. And, you know, he, you know, wanted to take you know, credit for most of the stuff and, you know, so eventually I just said, hey, look, I, you know, I don't need this. I don't need to make this drive, you know, every weekend, uh, you know, up to, uh, you know, Baltimore. Mm -hmm. He said, why don't I just start my own film production company right here in New Jersey? And I got, you know, my friend, it was a good friend of mine, John Dodds, uh, who did the Grog films. And I knew him and, you know, I brought him into work and we worked together on uh, Night Beast. And I called him up one day and I said, hey, why don't we just start our own um film production company right here in New Jersey and make a, make a, a low-budget science fiction monster movie. And he said, sounds like a great idea. And, and that was as simple as that. We just started working on a film right away, which the first film turned out to be The Deadly Spawn. Right. Before we get to that, I was curious, though, I mean, Don Doler, he passed away about 15 years ago when he wasn't, you know, working and, you know, being a, a subversive artist. I mean, was he basically a good guy? Yeah, I mean, you know... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, he was a good guy, and we, and we had a, a, you know, a lot of fun together. Uh, I just didn't like the way he, you know, ran the business part of, of uh, you know, what he was doing. Um, uh, because, you know, he, I mean, he still owed me a lot of money from stuff that I, you know, never got paid. And, you know, again, I don't want to say anything bad about the guy, because, right. you know, we certainly were friends and, and had a good stuff together. But, you know, toward the end, I just 
figured, you know, let him do what he wants to do, and I want to, you know, I'll do my own thing, you know, here in Jersey. But otherwise, no, I thought, you know, Don was fine. You know, we were friends. We hang out. We had a good time together. And at Night Beast had uh, Richard Dizel, who uh, later became a horror host. What's he like? A nice guy. Nice guy. I mean, pretty much everybody in, in, in the films in those days, I mean, we just had a good time. I mean, don't forget, we, uh, very rarely would we stay more than a few days. We were shooting, you know, a lot of times just on weekends. So it's like I would drive from New Jersey, you know, stop in New Brunswick, pick up John, drive mm-hmm. out to Baltimore, you know, on either a Thursday or Friday, then we'd stay those few days and then come back because we had we all had jobs, you know, we had we'd have to go to work in the morning, so you know we could take off every now and then, but you know for the most part we were up there just shooting on weekends. Nice, nice. So what's the genesis of the Deadly Spawn? Well, that was it. I mean, I pretty much I, I decided to, to let's start a film company here. I talked to John about it. You know, we got together, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, from then on, we just started to put the thing together. I, I just came up with a, a short story. You know, something I liked. I figured, hey, let's put a you know um, uh, a dormant spore in a, in a meteor and have it uh, you know crash to Earth and people find it. And as it eats them, the thing keeps getting bigger. And I thought, I said, well, I thought this was a real novel idea. I said, oh, this is something new. And then all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, it's the blob. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much with a monster instead of a blob. I mean, it's the same thing, but I really didn't think about that at the time. Um, so that was, uh, you know, that was a story. I knew there'd be a kid in it uh, that was a big science fiction fan. And, and you know, some of the, you know, the, some of the gags in the film. And I just, you know, wrote an outline for that. And then uh, we brought in uh, someone else who was a friend of uh, John's, uh, Doug McCune, to, to be the director. Because we couldn't, at first, we were going to do everything ourselves. Me and John were going to, um, you know, produce, write, direct, do the entire thing. But then we, all, we had jobs. And so it's like we really couldn't, you know, do it all ourselves. So, um you know, we brought him in, and you know, then you know, toward the end, him and and John are having a uh, to do. So uh, you know, uh, he, you know, Doug eventually left the, the production, and you know, we we finished it, and that was it. But we were very lucky that you know we ended up getting a a theatrical release with a, a small little sixteen millimeter film like that. Um, so we were, you know, very lucky. It was, you know, the right place, at the right time. I mean, we had we had to put enough gore in it. We had because back then in the '80s, you know, the gore films were a, were a popular thing. So you know, we had to have you know some of that stuff in there. And uh, so we just hey, we did the best we could. We had you know, budget was like twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> movie. So you know, we just did the best we could with what we had. Yeah, what I like about the movie, it's it's a real New Jersey movie because a lot of those cheesy horror sci-fi movies that came out in the 50s, for some reason they all took place in the South. And I always wondered why that was, you know? I remember Jay Leno even had a joke about it. He's like, you always see those movies and aliens, they land in the middle of the swamp with Bob Buki and his cousin Weenie. <laughs> you know? I just, I never understood that. But it, this, this was something that was different, though. <clears throat> was uh, Douglas McKeon an old friend of yours? No, he was he was John's friend, and he knew him because he he did work uh, on on some plays, I think, in in New York, and brought him into the production. And uh, you know, things were you know fine for a while, but you know, again, they had a falling out, you know, during the production. And you know, at a certain point, you know, I had to you know side with one or the other, and and you know, and John was my partner, so of course, you know, I I always would side with him, and uh, and that was that. So uh, you know, we talked about it, and then we just had to let uh, Doug go at that point. So he just. He left the production. And, eh, he did his own thing, and we, you know, we finished up, and yeah, everything is fine now. I mean, again, that was, you know, many, many years ago. I mean, I, I harbored a grudge for a long time, but you know, after a while, I mean, I don't know how many years it is now from 1983. You're right. We actually was making the film probably in '81, so I mean, until now, that's a that's a long time. So you know, we forgot all about it. Did did everything you wrote on the page end up on screen? For pretty much. I, I mean, again, I I just did the basic storyline. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that we had, so yeah, that ended up there. Then, then Doug, you know, we would, you know, all get together and come up with with ideas. And then Doug, you know, went off and and, and wrote the thing. But I mean, yeah, I mean, we would come up with stuff on the set. I mean, you know, we were, you know, we make changes right there. So because it was it was pretty fast and loose with what was going on because you know we were just again we did the same thing. We we you know a lot of us had jobs. So to start out, we were shooting just on weekends. You know, we'd only shoot like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then. 
I think one time during the production, I, I tried to get a little bit more money, and we got a guy come in and we shot for like five days in a row, which was humongous for us. So, uh, but that, you know, that was it. It was just, you know, mostly just shooting on weekends. Yeah, the, the Paramount almost brought, almost bought the movie, right? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a strange thing. I, I at the time, um, you know, in the eighties, Paramount was still their their main headquarters was still in New York. And I said, you know what, I've, I'm getting offers from a number of different places on the film. I mean, Troma wanted the film. Um, and I said, why don't I just try to bring it into, you know, to, to Paramount just for, you know, just for laughs. And so I, I took it in there to them and, and I brought the 60 minute print and they, they screened it. They called me back. They, they called me in for another meeting. I went in. They said, well, it's actually past the first um, screening. Uh, we're going to actually now uh, send it out to um, California to our offices there, and uh, and if it passes through that, we'll be authorized to make you an offer for distribution. And I was like, what? So I said, well, wait a minute. I said, well, you have to send my. Six I was the only sixty billion print I had at the time. They said, yeah, but don't worry, we'll take real good care of it. And I said, fine. Um, you know, so they sent it out to California. They came back and they called me up to, you know come in and they just said you know, they were very upset they just said look we're you know we're really pulling for you here you know on this thing because you know we knew how much it meant to you but they, they just said it was a little bit too rough uh for paramount to you know for it to be a paramount film and yeah which you know but you know again it shouldn't have been a surprise to me but you know you start getting caught up in this stuff and you start to think maybe there is maybe there is a chance and so but we didn't uh you know we didn't get it and, you know actually all this stuff i don't know whether you know about it. i i actually wrote a my, a book called Making um, the, the Dead, Making the Deadly Spawn. Uh -huh. uh, so that book is out now either on eBay or on Amazon. So it has it's a full color, uh, you know, book that explains all the stuff uh, you know about the behind the scenes on making a thing with tons and tons of behind the scenes photos. So if you you know <laughs> your listeners can, can like I said find it. it's called Making the Deadly Spawn on either Amazon.com or on eBay. I'll definitely check that out. Yeah. Uh, Gene Simmons allegedly owns the severed head of the kid's mother. Do you know if that's true? <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I, I think it is true because um, I forget the guy's name. Uh, Tim, I think one of the one of the guys from the the production um, that that knew John, I think, got it from him, and I, and I got to Gene. Uh, I, I sent. I actually sent. Uh, uh, Gene, uh, a couple of emails, you know, back when I, I, I forget somebody had some information on him, and I sent that up, but he never replied. You know, I just wanted to talk to him about it, but I never got any response from him. But yeah, I, I do believe that's true. Yeah, I, I particularly like you know Ellen's death of being decapitated and thrown into the window. I mean, because that's that's something you don't see too often in horror movies. I thought that was pretty brutal. I love it. Yeah, well, it was, and it wasn't supposed to happen. I mean, she was actually supposed to survive at the end, but but uh, unfortunately, she got a job. I think she got a job in a play or something, and and so she had to leave the production. So, you know, I immediately said, "Well, but, you know, what's the most brutal way we can <laughs> dispatch of her?" And that that was pretty much it. Well, which was tough because you know, back, again, you're dealing with old primitive stuff. You're dealing with with stuff back in the uh, early '80s where you really didn't have much knowledge about the stuff. I mean, we didn't even have knowledge about you know, sugar glass. You had to get glass for a window to break and, you know, make, you know, duplicates of this thing. Because don't forget, everything you see, anytime you saw a spawn move even, they, they, you had to be moved, you know, operated from underneath or behind or something. So, you know, you had to have cutaway parts of the carpet or floors or ceilings or walls. It all had to be specially made so you can operate these things from, you know, underneath or behind. Yeah. And, you know, everyone's getting eaten alive and then suddenly... <laughs> She's getting decapitated through out of a window. I guess it was left field, you know. <laughs> Are you amazed at the cult following this movie has had over the years? Yeah, it, it does always surprise me because it was a, it was a very low budget, you know, movie, and and how much got done with it, it, it was was pretty incredible because you know it went from. You know, they they made like seventy prints or something, and and those prints went around the world. I mean, so the film was was really shown around the world, and we you know we did get a, a pretty good amount of publicity about the film. You know, there, there were there were newspaper ads, there were television commercials, and there were, uh, you know, books and magazines doing stuff. So so uh, yeah, it always did surprise me because it was it was such an inexpensive film uh, that. Uh, but people still just enjoyed watching you know monsters that weren't just CGI stuff, but were real rubber and you know puppets and articulate you know stuff and makeup, real prosthetic effects. Uh, they just enjoyed that. So uh, 
the film has, you know, oddly to this day, still, you know, even some filmmakers have contacted me that were influenced by it. You know, I forget the guy's name that did uh, what was the, name of the film with the little spawn-like creatures in the tub. Um, uh, sounds familiar. Oh, sl- Slitherous? I don't, I don't remember. But anyway, it was, it, it was something. But, you know, these guys, I would ask them, and they said, no, Deadly Spawn was definitely a... Uh, definitely an influence on uh, on either you know creatures or a storyline or something so it was nice hearing that after after all these years but yeah it surprises me that the, the thing is still out there and you know people con- constantly are contacting me about you know oh, we want like to release it on vhs or we'd like to you know do another version of this or that and i think um sometime pretty soon uh synapse is going to be coming out with a uh, uh, like a 4k transfer of the film uh which is probably going to be you know the best that ever looked Nice, nice. So you were a special effects supervisor on Mind Killer. How did that come about? Um, I knew uh, uh, Michael Kruger from uh, Fantastic Films magazine. Uh, we were friends, and then he decided to start a, a film production uh, company in Denver. Um, uh, so he, you know, contacted me, and you know, we would discuss you know films. And you know, I did the first film. At first, it was called I like the title. It was called Brain Creature, and then he wanted to change it to Mind Killer because he thought that was classier. But eh, whatever. So um, he just asked me about uh, would I like to get involved and help out with some story elements. I said sure, and, and if I knew effects people, I could you know hire effects people and to, to supervise a crew to, to do the effects. And I said sure, and I. I contacted my friends, you know, Vincent Guastini and, and um, you know, just some of the people I knew at the time and put together a crew and we went out there and we did that. And then after, you know, uh, Mind Killer, he had like a three picture deal. Uh, we did Lone Wolf and um, and I think we had Pat Denver out there for that, the John Denver's son, which was pretty funny because he looks just <laughs> like him, poor guy. Oh, yeah. And, um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, no, so we had a you know, good time with that. We didn't know that, uh, you know, Michael was sick and he never told anybody. And then, you know, when he, you know, when he died, you know, that was, you know, pretty much the end of that. But but uh, he was a real good guy. Yeah, it's a very underrated movie. And I think Lone Wolf is a very underrated movie, too. I talked to John Callis uh, several months ago. He's an, he's an intense guy. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. Yeah, what's he like to work with? Well, I mean, he, he was... You know, Michael really wanted me down there just to to um, uh, you know handle some stuff with uh, getting effects guys together, and then just to keep my eye on the production, uh, and w- which I would do. But you know, every time I make a, a, a suggestion, Callus would go, "Yeah, do it on your next Spawn movie. Do it on your next Spawn." <clears throat> you know, so I mean, he was just trying to you know here I'm trying to help you know, but he was trying to. I, I, for whatever reason, I don't know. Like you said, he was an intense guy. I mean, at one point he was shooting a scene in the, in the gym and all the people are running toward the camera. And, and and so finally he says, cut. He goes, okay, let's move on. And I go, no, wait a minute, hold, just leave everything set up. And, and he got pissed off because I went and said that. And, you know, But I, I pulled him aside and I said, listen, I said, these people are supposed to be you know, horrified and scared and running out, they're all laughing. I said, you know, you know, because sometimes it's hard to see when you're, you know, watching it, you're not watching live, you're watching it on a monitor, but their faces are tiny, tiny little dots and you can't see and I'm right there standing next to the camera so I could see these people are laughing and you know, whatever. So sure enough, he went back and pointed it and looked at it. So, okay, you know, you know, you're right. And I, you know, there were just a couple of incidences like that, you know, that, that happened, but, but otherwise, you know, it was fine. I mean, we ended up, you know, we ended up getting along, and that was, you know, that was, hey, the film got done. That's the main thing. Yeah, I like the way the the werewolf looks in the movie, too. I think if there had been a little bit more money, it could have been, you know, just as good as Rob Bottin's um, howling, you know, werewolves and stuff. Yeah, I really like it. Yeah, he's really, he's really good. I, you know, I mean, he does some good stuff. But again, it's just, you know, the only holdback is money. I mean, these films are all ultra, ultra low-budget movies. So, I mean, you know, low budget in Hollywood is now, what, like 50 million or 30 million? I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> you know, they're making movies for <laughs> two and three hundred million dollars. So, so to make movies that are, you know, less than a hundred thousand dollars, it's really amazing that they, <laughs> they even get done at all. Absolutely. What made you um, finally step into the director's chair with Regenerated Man? Well, be- because we did, after. Um, Deadly Spawn, we wanted to, you know, immediately go to Deadly Spawn 2 now, because, you know, don't forget, we had a film, uh, you know, Deadly Spawn hit the theaters, yeah. um, so now I said, I don't want to do 60 mm anymore, I want to I want to move to 35 millimeter, and so we started putting together um, 
uh, deadly spawn two uh, metamorphosis, and uh, I ended up with you know two partners on there that you know I thought were like friends of mine, and instead you know they had their own agenda you know on the film, and uh, so that it turned out to be a fiasco, and we, you know, we had a good budget on the film. I mean you know at the time I mean I was working in the phone company, I had to leave that job, which was a phenomenal job, because you know the investors pretty much said, you know, we're, we're giving you, you know, over a million dollars to do a movie. We want this to be your job, not your hobby. So uh, I had to leave and, you know, do this full time. And, you know, I was just, you know, having partners that, again, had their own agenda that, uh, that screwed up. And still, you know, it was a good film. We had a lot of good stuff in there. You know, good, you know, Ken Burton doing animation. Uh, um, uh, what's his name? Um, I, I forget. We had a number of people in there that were doing just, just fantastic work. Uh, so the, the film, you know, turned out to be pretty good. It had a lot of really cool effects in it. You know, Vincent Guastini again headed up a, a phenomenal effects team. Uh, we Dan Taylor was a friend of mine um, uh, in the, that was working at ILM. And so, but again, but because of the situation with partners, I said, you know what, I'd rather go back and do a real low budget movie and, you know, have more control myself than to have to put up with this, you know, kind of crazy stuff. And so that's what happened after that came out going through that fiasco. I said, uh, you know, let me do The Regenerated Man, which was just a little, another little movie. It was, it was actually started out to be a Hideous Sun Demon 2 because I knew Robert Clark at the time. And I asked him about either being in the film and, and can I do that? And he said, yes, give me permission to do it. So I was starting to get that together. And when the thing fell apart with him, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> uh, well, he died. Uh, so I said, let me just go and, and do this. And so I just changed it around and, and made it the regenerated man. And again, we had, you know, it was a very, very low budget, but, you know, we, we got, the, you know, we got it finished. And, you know, again, the, you know, Vince Guastini came in, did a did a great job uh, on the effects, and Dan at the time was was working at ILM. Uh, he had access to some of the computer uh, stuff, the, the dinosaur skins and things from like Jurassic Park, <laughs> and so he actually did the, the sequence at the end where the creature comes up. That's that's all stuff from the soft image uh, uh, computer environment that they were working on at the time that he was able to do stuff with and, and use that. So so that's a uh, you know that was kind of cool. Yeah. Then you did uh, Vampire Vixens from Venus, and you got to work with my good friend Michelle Bauer, who, by the way, says hi. I uh, talked to her the other day because it was her birthday, and I mentioned I was going to be talking to you, so she said, oh, give Ted my love. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, she's, she's absolutely fantastic. Um, we just did that film because when I was... Uh, after I finished with uh, Regenerated Man, we had uh, two or three companies were, were bidding on, on getting it. And so the one company was Janicki Entertainment. And I told them, I said, hey, look, instead of you, you know, taking this film, I said, that is already done and you have you know, nothing to say about it. Why don't, there's another film I have in mind to do uh, called, uh, you know, the, well, Vampire Invaders or Vampire Vixens of Venus had a number of titles. I said that you can look at this thing and, and be part of it right from the beginning. And they said, okay, fine. So I was able to let the, you know, the, uh, the regenerated man go to Arrow. And, and, and so Shanaki took the, um, uh, you know, uh, Vampire Vixens of Venus, which uh -huh. was, again, was, was kind of cool. So I got to, you know, work with, I mean, the casting was, was phenomenal, you know, having all the girls come down. But I got to work with Michelle, who I've known for many, many years because uh, I'm good friends with Fred Ray since the early 80s. And um, and J.J. North, I, I, I met through, you know, the, you know, casting that film. And Leslie Glass, who was the uh, Penthouse International Pet of the Year, yeah. uh, who was also phenomenal uh, in the movie. So it was, just, it was just a fun little thing to put together. It was, you know, again, a, a fun movie. Uh, at the time, unfortunately... Um, Shanky didn't listen to me. I, I told them, I said, you know, let's not call the film Vampire Vixens or Venus anymore. And they said, how come? I said, well, because there's a slew of these, like, little tricky title films, you know, yeah. has two teens from the year 2000. And, you know, bad Girls from Mars. All these, you know, movies that had these play on word titles. And they said, and they, and they weren't doing very well because, well, A, because they were crap. But, but <laughs> uh, B, it was just that type of thing wasn't. You know, too popular time. I said, let's just change it back to uh, uh, Vampire Invaders and make it, you know, more like a, you know, emphasize more of the science fiction stuff rather than it being this little tricky comedy thing. Uh, but they didn't want to do it, and um, I said, <clears throat> okay, fine. So 
what happened, unfortunately, is that film got lumped into, you know, all of those type of films. And when it came out at the time, because you had people, your VHS was still out and there were still video stores. Um, but because they heard the title and lumped it with all these other films, they just weren't buying it in, in droves. So, I mean, the film, like I said, did okay, but it just didn't do the kind of business we wanted it to do uh, because it got, uh, it got that, that bad rap. Right, Fred did uh, Bad Girls from Mars a few years before that, so yeah, those titles were pretty common at the time. How how, how did you get the legendary Charlie Callis to play a bartender? Well, he he, he was local, and I just asked him, and and that was and that was it. We, I, I had at the time I was doing a radio show uh, called Hollywood East mm-hmm. uh, on WVNJ, which no longer exists, I believe, in Teaneck, and. Um, so uh, during this radio show, we had on all kinds of, you know, uh, film people. I, you know, because I was working with um, Kevin Clement with uh, Chiller Theater since the, the beginning, uh, I had access to a lot of people to come down for the radio show. So I would do the show and just have people come down and, and you know, uh, someone said about him coming down to do, you know, uh, a show for to a comic or whatever he's doing. And I just mm-hmm. asked him about doing the movie. And he said, sure. And he was, he was a, a lot of fun. Yeah, he was crazy. I mean, I had... <laughs> telling him we, we'd go to have meetings, we'd be in a you know, diner or something, meeting about stuff, and he had people want to entertain the whole place. And I said, you know, we're here for a meeting. I said, if you're going to keep this up, we'll just meet at my house, and we won't do this anymore. Because, you know, he felt he had to entertain. You know? Yeah, there's no, no, no guy funnier than Charlie Callis. I mean, with those sounds that he did, you know, and those faces, like he'd be on the Dean Martin roast playing characters, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, he was he was a he was a funny guy, and uh, you know we we had a lot of fun with him on the on the set. It was it was a it was a pretty fun shoot. Did you like Did you like directing the most? Uh, it was it was all right. I, you know, I mean, it's to, to to do things. You know, I mean, at that at that point, I I could because um, I, I wasn't, I didn't have a full-time job anymore, so that's mm-hmm. what I was doing. I mean, for X amount of years, from probably 1980-something, uh, I don't remember, until, you know, into the, the 90s, uh, I guess. I mean, that was that was my full-time you know, job, was making movies. So, you know, so, so I mean, I, I went through, you know, besides the Vampire Vixens, there was Mind Killer, Lone Wolf, I did Fantastic Film Show 1 and 2, which only got released in Japan, mm-hmm. Generation X, Destination Fame, The Sting of Ours, Hell on Earth. So, you know, I had a, you know, a, a, a string of films there um, until, you know, I retired. So from October 29th to 31st, you'll be at Chiller Con in Persephone, New Jersey. Uh, have you done that show before? I, I've been doing it for 30 years. Oh, you know, like I said, Kevin is a friend of mine, and so you know, I went down the, the first time. I uh, I went down. Someone someone called me up and said, you know, there's a show that uh, just about these films that you like. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, this 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 horathon thing or whatever it was called at the time. You know, back in Hackensack, and I went down there and I just wanted to know about it. And I, I went into the front and I said, you know, I just want to know. You know, I'm a film director. And I want to you know know more about the show. And they go, yeah, you're a film director. What'd you do? Right? Hey, what'd you do? And, I said, well, I made the, the Deadly Spawn. He goes, well, you made Deadly Spawn? Wait right here. You know, so he runs him over and he grabs Kevin. Kevin says, this is the guy that made Deadly Spawn. And from that time on, I've been friends with Kevin. And I've been to every show for 30 years now. So, yeah. Yeah. What's the craziest thing a fan has ever asked you to sign? Um, well, I mean, sometimes they ask me to sign them. You know, yeah. <laughs> uh, bizarre, or or someone, you know, some other film, and, uh, you know, some crazy thing, but nothing, nothing too uh, too unusual. I, I know one time it was really funny. You know, we were sitting there, and <clears throat> I was with um, Alice Cooper, uh. and and uh, one of the guys was doing an interview asked us. They said, "Well, you guys are like horror guys. You know what uh, what scares you?" And we both said needles at the same time and so i start laughing i go and he goes what's so funny i go that's well, like yeah well you with the tattoos i said i how you he goes he goes ted because you understand he goes i have not had a needle touch my body for like i don't know how many years because i have i don't have one tattoo on my body it's makeup and it always has been makeup i have not one tattoo on my body <laughs> I, went, I went oh okay he goes what i like to do is play golf <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, are you writing another book? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, 
uh, like I said, besides the uh, the Candid Monsters uh, series, uh, I did the making of the Deadly Spawn, and so yes, right now I'm working on uh, uh, volume thirteen, which is volume thirteen. Uh, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, Freaks, The Devil Doll. I mean, I'm doing a series now where I did a whole bunch of the uh, a whole bunch of them, probably five or six books on uh, like fifties films, yeah. and now I'm going back and doing twenties uh, to the forties. And, you know, I, I forgot how many really good films there were, were at, at, during that time, you know, like The Metropolis and Freaks and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, The Hunchback. I, I mm-hmm. mean, you know, there, there were really a lot of really good movies. So, um, you know, I'm doing a few of those. Then I'm going to probably do uh, a book on uh, stop motion animation films. Uh, then I might do one on Hitchcock films. And, you know, so I, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll see where it goes from there. But I want to do a children's book as well. A children's book. Wow, that's the last thing I'd expect from you. <laughs> uh, well, but, it's a deadly children's book, so there'll be monsters in it, of course. But oh, okay. I, I, I might do also a follow-up because the the original book uh, was called "Making Low Budget Science Fiction Films: A Real Horror Story," and that was really explaining about all the films. But I realized I had so much information about Deadly Spawn. I said, "Let me just do one entire book on the making of the Deadly Spawn, and then I'll do another book that." you know, has the other 10 or 11 films. Um, so that might be something I, I, I might do in the future, is, is do the other, because it's, it's, it's 80% written already, because I, I had written it for that, that thing where all of them were in there, but I just sort of took Deadly Spawn off of that group, and now I already have most of the other stuff written, so I can come up with another volume. Nice. Well, I hope it turns out well for you. I will definitely get that Deadly Spawn book, and I hope you have a great appearance um, at ChillerCon, like usual. And I thank you so much for coming on today, Ted. It's my pleasure, and uh, it was a lot of fun uh, just reliving the past. Yeah. So thanks a lot. My pleasure. Have a great day, and please stay safe. You too. Take care now. Okay, bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Ted Bohus. Ain't he a cool dude? Nice guy. Great stories. Had no idea he had written so many books. I will definitely check out the Deadly Spawn book. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes!